All right, next up is uh, Senate Bill 1296 Bitcoin. Senator Herndon. All right, Senator Herndon, if you will state your name and who you represent, and then take us through this bill, if you would, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, my name is Scott Herndon, and I represent District 1 here in the Senate. And Benjamin's handing out some information that I'm going to walk you through before we get into the details of the bill. Because when I first studied cryptocurrencies, I had to study it like I was in kindergarten, essentially. Just make sure, I want to make sure everybody understands uh, the basics of what a cryptocurrency is before we talk about the regulations provided in the bill. So first page I have is the what I call the basics of the monetary system. So that just says in our, our current monetary system, there are five things that are accomplished. One, we create and produce money in our fiat money system of the US dollar. That's free to create and produce money. Uh, we also store money. We do payment processing. That's the authorization and verification of transactions. We do settlements between banks at the central bank or through the Bank of International Transfers. We also do record keeping. So these are the things that banks do for us. So banks basically control these five steps in our traditional fiat currency monetary system. And there are different things that money does for us. I have that right there on page one. It facilitates trade, it stores our excess wealth, and it can be used to determine a common value of items or services for trade. So there are certain advantages to having a bank-controlled monetary system. I list those there on the first page. But the key to understand is that the system is centrally controlled. So it concentrates powers in the hands of the major banks, in essence. They control the ledgers. They control the debits and credits to those ledgers. They control the database, essentially, of the money system. And when you go, you have to qualify and present your ID to get access to that system, to open up an account. But they have all of the controls. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are a distributed ledger technology. In a distributed ledger technology, no one player controls the database. So distributed ledger technologies aren't just used for cryptocurrencies. There's an actual, there are several companies, for example, one that provides a distributed Oracle database. So if anybody has ever done computer programming and use systems, the underlying database can actually be shared. And the key with a distributed ledger, its biggest advantage is that users who would otherwise not be able to trust each other, the, the use of the cryptography verifies that the transactions are valid and that the data is accurate. So that whereas if we all didn't know each other in the room, the validation through the distributed ledger technology is what ensures that we are, have accurate transactions, that we have an accurate database that we could all read and write to that database. And that's what's different between a bank system is we can't read and write to their database. But in a distributed ledger technology, anybody in the world can write to the database. So that's the power of a cryptocurrency system. So on the second, if you turn that top page over, I kind of show you how those five stages of the monetary system are used in a cryptocurrency system, and I use Bitcoin in particular. So the creation and production of money, unlike the US dollar where we just print it, is actually done by Bitcoin miners. Bitcoin is essentially a program. It's a digital currency, and the Bitcoin miners and the work that they do extracts more Bitcoin into circulation. There's a cost of production. I always say, think of it like gold. So in order to use gold as a currency or silver as a currency, we actually have to expend resources to go extract gold and silver from the ground and then use it for transactions. Bitcoin is the same way. Miners actually have to invest in equipment and build a business in order to extract more, more Bitcoin. They're literally mining for the Bitcoin to add currency to the system. Now, anybody can be a miner. So again, we're not concentrating that ability to create currency 
in a single centralized hand. Then there's the storage of money and Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies do that through digital wallets that are either online or offline. So you can have literally a USB drive and that can contain your cryptocurrency. There's public processing. So when I want to or payment processing and it's done over the distributed network over the network all around the world so if i decide to pay one of you senators for a transaction let's say you cut my hair and i'm going to pay you in bitcoin we process a transaction that are there are apps that do it and that transaction goes out into the internet literally the network of bitcoin miners and nodes and it gets validated and it's that process of validating that assures that the bitcoin i paid to one of you was mine to pay and that i'm not double paying and the way it does that is a combination of public keys and private keys public keys picture the post office box at your U.S. Postal Center across the street, everybody has an address, and the private key is the actual physical key to unlock that box. And it's the combination of those two, public keys and private keys, ensure that I own the Bitcoin that I'm using to pay a transaction, it tells who I want to pay to, and it verifies that we're not double paying and that all of the transactions are validated. Right now, all transaction validation in our typical banking system is done by the banks and the payment processor. So again, it's centralized versus decentralized. Okay, so miners, and that's what a lot of this bill is about, is the right to use Bitcoin and to mine Bitcoin. They are essential to the process. If you go to the top of my second page in your pack, pack so it's really page three, I talk about Bitcoin mining, it's essential. And there's two ways the miners participate in the process. and and to jump to the chase, on the back of that page there is a picture of a Bitcoin mining machine. It's a computer called an ASICS, A-S-I-C-S. -S. And what the Bitcoin miners are doing is they are doing calculations. Their computers are processing calculations and the one who solves the problem for each block of transactions gets to participate in the blockchain, moving those transactions through the system, and they get rewarded for their investment. These machines cost a few thousand dollars to $10,000 uh, based on how efficient they are. In the very beginning of days of Bitcoin in 2009, you could use your home computer to do it, but as there is more Bitcoin in circulation and more transactions, the cryptography becomes more difficult to calculate, so you need better computers to do it. And every year, the computers are getting more efficient. Uh, you have to cool the processors because they're running through a number of calculations. But here's the reward for the Bitcoin miners. They can earn transaction fees. So when we're processing my haircut transaction fee, they can earn a transaction fee. And if they essentially solve the, the equation that's gotta be solved so that they can participate in the blockchain, they, all, they actually extract Bitcoin 6.25 every time they solve the problem, 6.25 Bitcoin is added into circulation and in today's dollars that is worth $349,000. So Bitcoin mining is a business. This concept where you have computers all across the world that are processing Bitcoin transactions, this decentralized process, is called a proof of work process. There are two ways you could validate transactions in a cryptocurrency system. One's called proof of work, and the other one is called proof of stake. Proof of work is we buy some machines, we do some mining, our machines are running calculations, and they solve the problem, and they get to earn Bitcoin in transaction fees. That's the work that's being done. Proof of stake is an opposite system. It is used by some other cryptocurrencies. And what it means is that the person who holds the most stake, the stakeholder that has the most of that cryptocurrency gets to validate the transac transactions. So I would argue that proof of work, which uh, it's used for a lot of other applications, not just cryptocurrency, has advantages because it decentralizes the validation and proof of stake 
centralizes the validation. That's essentially exactly what we have in the banking industry today is we have the biggest stakeholders really control the ledger and control all the processing. So I would argue that proof of work and through the miners is absolutely necessary to the decentralization of the distributed ledger technology that's key to Bitcoin. Okay, so that's the first document. Now we're going to get into the bill. I hope that was relatively easy. I've also given you a separate packet. It's a little bit gray. And this is, I, I told a friend of mine who used to work on an e a uh, desk in on Wall Street, I said, a derivatives desk, I said, please create a little graph for people like you're teaching a five-year-old about crypto. So if you want to study cryptocurrencies, this is this little gray packet. And I've double-sided each page. And essentially, what, we're mo what we move to in the world of cryptocurrencies and this distributed ledger technology where we all share the database and can all get read-write access is it creates a system of trust, whereas you couldn't normally trust each other. So that's the main thing it's solving. And then in this packet, also as you can study on your own time, uh, we talk about this proof of work versus proof of stake concept. It's near the back of the packet. So the amount of work determines the read-write privilege in a proof-of-work concept is your second to last page in that gray packet versus the proof-of-stake, which is the amount of holdings. Now, the work that the miners do takes energy. And so that's, that's the part of the issue that we're solving in the bill. So these computers actually take energy to run the calculations, and so that's why we start talking about energy in the bill. Let's get into some details of the bill. I'm also going to refer, I think you got a letter from Avista, Idaho Power, and there are some misunderstandings in the letter. And so I'm going to show as we go through the bill where the letter doesn't actually represent what the bill does. So start on uh, page one of the bill. We actually define terms. We talk about what Bitcoin is. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network of computers that participate in the exchange of the world's first digital currency. And Bitcoin was the first digital currency. It is currently the most popular digital currency. It has a transaction record rate over 15 years so far. There are 19 million Bitcoin in circulation. They're valued at almost $60,000 per Bitcoin today. So it's quite a bit of value. And they have a 99.99% transaction verification accuracy record being used over 15 years. So Bitcoin is by far the biggest player and that's gonna end up being one last handout I show you. So we define Bitcoin. We define Bitcoin mining as the use of electricity to power a computer for the purpose of validating and securing the Bitcoin network. And we talk about what a Bitcoin mining business is. Unlike, uh, there was a question in the, uh, the Idaho Power document that questions why we have Bitcoin mining versus home Bitcoin mining and whether we're confusing the two. And no, we're not in the bill. We are being very specific that a Bitcoin mining business uses more than one megawatt of electricity in a year versus a home Bitcoin mining business, which would be in a residential neighborhood, uses less than one megawatt of energy in a year, which if you look at the standard amount of energy used by a home, that's a little bit higher than your typical home, but the point is it clearly doesn't represent a data center use of energy. So the bill very clearly only speaks to essentially, for the most part, the regulation of a Bitcoin mining business that is not a home Bitcoin mining business. To tell you why one might have, one could actually have one of these computers at home mining Bitcoin. So you could spend a couple of grand a day and take and get a Bitcoin mining computer and put the software on it and participate in Bitcoin mining. However, if you're running one at home, you're very likely not going to basically be the one whose computer solves the blockchain and you're probably not going to really make any money doing that. So 
Helm Bitcoin mining, though it's an option for people, the reality is, is, is because of the number of transactions that are being processed around the world, in order to actually earn money in the business, you're probably going to need to run a number of computers. And there's a, there's a Bitcoin mining business, I believe, in Burley. I want to say it operates 2,500 machines. It's a true data center. It's a true employer. You actually have to employ people. Uh, it presents good jobs with good, good wages, and it doesn't require a lot of training for the workers. And so it's a legitimate business industry. Texas has a lot of Bitcoin miners in the state of Texas. And, and they're all throughout the world, and we have some right here in Idaho today. So what the bill talks about is we define terms. We, we do define a data center. Avista mentioned our definition of data center. That's because I want to make sure that for the purposes of this chapter that we're adding to Idaho code, that we have a definition here so that this chapter can be interpreted, so that we're not borrowing definitions of data center from another cha unknown chapter. And so that when people read our chapter about the Bitcoin Protection Act, they know exactly what we're talking about. So let's, let's talk about what the bill basically says. On page two, it talks about your right to mine Bitcoin. I kind of think of this as like the Bitcoin Bill of Rights. It could, could, uh, we could write a Bill of Rights for any cryptocurrency, but this is the number one cryptocurrency in the world. So neither the state nor local government shall enact an ordinance, resolution, or a rule that imposes requirements on a Bitcoin mining business so that is the industrial use business, not the home Bitcoin business, uh, that are not also the requirements for data centers in its jurisdiction. So we basically want Bitcoin mining businesses not to be discriminated against. And I'm going to kind of explain why that's a potential risk uh, in the world of Bitcoin. We also don't want to pre prevent a home Bitcoin business from being at a private residence. And this is a business that uses a low amount of energy, probably is only running one or two computers to participate in the mining operation. It's not being run as a business. It might be more like a hobby. And we don't want to have some city zone that out of business. OK, we talk about rate making in the bottom of page two, section 285404, and what we say is the Idaho Public Utilities Commission may not establish a rate classification for Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin mining businesses, or home Bitcoin mining that creates unduly discriminatory rates. So up above, we were talking about zoning and zoning people out of their ability to do Bitcoin mining, and now we're talking about rate making. And on the back of your Avista letter, uh, they say this actually. It, they, they say it's unnecessary because it's duplicative in Idaho code. So really, there isn't a problem with us having it in this chapter of code either to reiterate that we don't want undue, unduly discriminatory rate making. Uh, on the Avista letter, again, I'm kind of jumping in to address their concerns. They're worried about their ability to curtail energy usage of a Bitcoin miner. So let's say you have a business that's using too much energy and we're at a peak load and they need to... Uh, involuntarily get that business to uh, reduce their load for a time period to balance the load. Nothing in this legislation would pro prohibit a Vista or Idaho Power or any other power provider from doing curtailments. So while they raise the concern about curtailments, nothing about the legislation would prevent curtailments. And in fact, in Texas, the Bitcoin miners, when the when the grid gets overloaded, are some of the first ones to volunteer to shut off power voluntarily so that they don't have to be curtailed. And that allows that energy to be used elsewhere in the grid. And so the reason they can do that is because Bitcoin mining that goes on around the world continues to propel the network. So you're never dependent upon one individual location for where the Bitcoin miners are operating. Okay, that's page two. Page three of the bill basically just says that state and local government should not enact a, an ordinance or a law that prohibits or impairs your ability to basically have a cryptocurrency wallet and possess your own Bitcoin. This is, to me, a private property right that we're stating here. And then the next section on taxation if I go buy a haircut, 
from one of you and I pay in Bitcoin, then it's going to be subject to sales tax, could be subject to income tax. But what this section uh, 285406 does is there will be no additional tax that is just because we are using Bitcoin as the method of payment. So that's what that section is about. Bitcoin nodes are, can be miners, and they're typically mining machines that are also the nodes, but they help to basically validate the network. And so we wanted to cover the term nodes, and your right to run a Bitcoin node is about your private property right as well. So that's why it's included in the legislation. Okay, the reason that it's important to have a bill on something like Bitcoin is because the Biden administration has been somewhat hostile to Bitcoin. And in fact, at the very beginning of this month, on February 3rd, the Biden administration suddenly declared a U.S. crypto emergency after there were price surges in crypt cryptocurrencies, not just Bitcoin. And they asked their Energy Information Administration to basically go to the miners of different cryptocurrencies and demand information from the miners. And I'll argue two reasons why they would want to do that. But in reality, the miners pushed back. They've sued the Biden administration. And a federal court has issued an injunction against the Biden administration so that the miners don't have to provide that data. Governments can either be very friendly toward cryptocurrency or they can be hostile. The reason you might want to be hostile toward a cryptocurrency is if you decide that you don't like the idea of regular people controlling a currency market and the distributed ledger technology. If you decided that you wanted to consolidate that power in the hands of a government, you could do that. And one of the ways you could do it is if you have a cryptocurrency that's controlled by the miners and that's validated by mining businesses, then you could say, well, they're not a green energy footprint and we will regulate them out of business. And if it's not a proof of stake validation of the cryptocurrency, then the cryptocurrency would be pushed out of business. It would no longer exist. So governments can become hostile if they determine it's in their strategic interest to concentrate power in the hands of government. I would like to, like to just end with this, and then I'd be happy to stand for questions. I know there's probably some testimony. And it is that the largest Bitcoin has become, it's, it's essentially the standard for cryptocurrency. It's the one that's been around the longest. And as it turns out, interestingly enough, Ida Corp Inc., which owns Idaho Power, their largest shareholder is BlackRock Advisors, and that's the sheet I gave you here. And just last month, the SEC approved the issuance of electronically traded funds, ETS for Bitcoin. So the second page is BlackRock's new ETF for Bitcoin. So it's that pretty graph there. Vanguard and BlackRock are the top shareholders of IdaCorp. And they're issuing a new Bitcoin ETF, and they're probably going to become the biggest player in Bitcoin. Uh, which is really interesting why then one of the companies that they own would be concerned about a Bitcoin Protection Act. And the way Bitcoin works is it depends on the miners. BlackRock will not be successful unless the miners are successful. And I hope that was uh, not too much and it's relatively easy to understand. I'm happy to stand for questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Very, very informative, very interesting. Um, Senators, any, any questions? Senator Ward Engel King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator Herndon, for the tutorial. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, um, characteristics of money, I'm, I'm looking at that and easily stored, commonly accepted, um, et cetera. But I guess one of the things I'm worried about, and I'm looking at the language in a couple different places, but it basically says um, neither the state nor local government shall enact an ordinance, resolution, or rule that prohibit, restricts, or otherwise impairs the ability of an individual to use the software. And then on the front, it uses similar, or on the second page, it uses similar language. I'm, that sounds awfully broad. As far as protection, I mean, for the consumer or maybe even 
if there was some kind of fraud involved or money laundering would that ever happen in this case i i don't know enough about this really i'm fishing Thank for you. answers senator herndon yes mr chairman and senator ward angle king so the intent of that language is just to say if we can control bitcoin let's say at the federal level through some undue regulation we could also potentially do it at the state level and we could also potentially do it at the local level because if uh, you had an industrial use zoned area and all of a sudden a government decided to become hostile to a very popular cryptocurrency one of the ways that you could put that cryptocurrency off of the map and out of business is by undue zoning regulations that just target that business so what all we're saying in this section of of code that we would be adding is that we cannot be discriminatory and treat cryptocurrency businesses differently than other similar businesses and so that's all that says as far as fraud I actually like to point out to people that the US dollar is a digital currency most of us when we trade US dollars turns out that 99.9% .9 of the transactions we do in digital or in US dollars are digital I've always said that our dollars are really just numbers on a screen. And there has been fraud and crime in transactions of US dollars. Uh, Bitcoin, because of its distributed ledger technology, is actually one of the hardest types of networks through the proof of work concept to commit fraud in because you actually have to invest a significant amount of money to actually make any money at Bitcoin. And that's what it takes to participate in the transaction process. And the more people that participate, the harder it is to do the cryptography. And it actually prevents fraud the more people that are involved. But in any system with human beings involved, there's always the potential for criminal action. This bill does not allow any criminal action. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess that was the question or the answer I was looking for is that there would be no criminal uh, recourse. I, am I hearing that right? Senator Herndon. Uh, yes, Chair, Mr. Chairman and Senator Ward Angle King. Any criminal recourse in the realm of Bitcoin would be a fraudulent transaction. Let's say I, I somehow was able to steal someone's Bitcoin and our cr normal criminal laws against theft and other types of criminal laws or stealing computers from a data center would apply in those circumstances. And by the way, that would be one of the possible crimes that does occur in the Bitcoin mining world is someone might break into your data center and take your Bitcoin mining machines. Senator Lakey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator Herndon also appreciate the education on how Bitcoin works. As you and I talked before, I. I don't know a whole lot about Bitcoin. Um, so I do have a couple of kind of specific questions. Uh, the home Bitcoin mining business, just thinking about you know, like the, the world of local zoning, um, local ordinances allow somebody to have a home-based business. Um, but they typically try to say, okay, you know, don't put in a big business in a neighborhood if you if you have something that really just operates within your home, you're not impacting anybody, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Um, I was wondering about that one megawatt standard. Uh, you mentioned that might be just a couple of computers, and I was curious kind of what that translates to. Are we talking about a business with multiple employees? And I, I hadn't seen the Avista and Idaho Power Letter. They, they compared it more to like a Costco or a Walmart. Um, at one megawatt. So anyway, if you could just comment on that uh, as to the size of what we're saying. Yes, Senator Herndon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Senator Lakey, one megawatt, the way I've written it into this legislation is the annual consumption. I know my house uses between 1,400 to 2,000 watts a day. So on an annual basis, that's approaching one megawatt. And so that's what we're talking about is actually is just a actual household. It means you're not consuming a lot of a Bitcoin mining machines. If you're running an actual business where you have a number of these computers, you're going to end up using more than one megawatt of electricity and you would no longer qualify as a home Bitcoin mining business. But what we don't want to preclude is a person who does sort of 
kind of like playing the lottery. If they think they can run one machine and one day they may actually solve the cryptography problem and be rewarded with six Bitcoin, that's $349,000. Your chance of doing it with a couple machines is almost infinitesimal, but it could happen. And it's like your ability to participate in the network is, uh, allows people to do that without really being a business. Thank you, follow Senator. Up. Follow up. Um, thank you, Senator. That's that's helpful. Um, and then looking at subsection three on page two, where any Bitcoin mining operation before existing before July one, twenty twenty four, can continue to operate. Um, so, in the land use world, which is part of what I wade around in, um, that would be what's called a lawful nonconforming use. Um, you're, you change the ordinance, people have a right to continue their business. But it's also, they, they don't have a right to expand it or grow it if they change that. Is, is that your intent, continuing to operate what they've been doing without, you know, adding a, really growing the business? Or what's your intent there? Senator Herndon. Yes, Mr. Chairman and Senator Lakey. Uh, my suspicion, number one, to get a new Bitcoin business up and running by July 1st is going to be pretty difficult, requires a significant investment. So I'm picturing this is grandfathering in because we're introducing a whole new chapter to code. It basically says we're not going to impair those who are already in a, an existing use prior to the effective date of this legislation. But then we would imagine over time that uh, like with all grandfathered clauses, non-conforming uses over time tend to weed out and we end up with all conforming uses at some point. And that's what this envisions as well. Follow up. Follow up, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Senator Herndon. So keep doing what you're doing or can they, if they change the zoning, grow it to 10 times the size it was when the, when the grandfathering right came into place? Senator Herndon. Yes, Mr. Chairman and Senator DeLakey, great clarification. I would say keep doing what you're doing, not envisioning that they have a, it's kind of like we did a bill uh, on a different subject that I carried this session where if you expand it, that is no longer covered under this grandfather clause. Thank you, um, Senator Herndon. It might be a benefit for a little clarification there, but appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And then, um, as far as the rate making, as, as you and I talked, I, I start to fidget a little bit when we're telling business what to do with their rates, um, more like in a rental context or whatever. Um, this is a PUC established rate, so that's a little bit different. I acknowledge that. Um, you can argue both ways. If it's already covered, you don't need it. If it's already covered, then why have it? Um, maybe just expound a little bit more there. Senator Herndon. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman and Senator Lakey. I wanted to make sure that it was understood that it applies specifically since we're talking about the Bitcoin Protection Act that I wanted to cover all areas that we wanted to make sure that we're covering protections for this particular industry. And so that's why I included it. Uh, I did talk to the power companies about the current rate schedule, and it was their opinion that they are not unduly discriminatory right now. So it, you might argue it's redundant, or we might argue that it's acceptable to be there because it's redundant and it doesn't impose on their abilities today, which is basically the conversation I had with them. But I bet someone's here to testify and may be able to answer. All right. Good. Any other questions? Senator Hartkin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator uh, Herndon, on page two, line 42, that kind of gives me a little cause uh, for consternation. I, you're talking about, uh, you've just kind of compared how I bank digitally because I electronically, you know, will deposit checks, et cetera. I kind of consider uh, cryptocurrency or coin Bitcoin money. You can buy things and spend things with the uh, Bitcoin. And so when you want to have it not be considered a money transfer requirement and, and you know, there's a money transmitter act. And, and I think that this should be part of it. I don't think it should be without not be in it because it is it is money. Right. Senator Herndon. Yes, Mr. Chairman, Senator Harkin, but neither are we when we're exchanging U.S. dollars or making payments through a typical point of sale are we considered the money transmitters. So a person engaged in home Bitcoin mining 
that has a Bitcoin business should not be considered a money transmitter. All you're actually doing is you're potentially helping to validate the blockchain, which is just the communication of transactions. You're not actually transmitting value. And so that's why we wanted to, it's, it's, it, they're no more a participant than you and I are a participant. In fact, a lot of the home machines are really just operating as nodes, which is just passing along the transactions in the network. So it's no different than if we ran a server at home and we were transacting business along the internet. Follow up? Follow up. But you stated earlier that um, you could use your Bitcoin in purchasing something at some point, and that's, that's going to be electronic as well. And so to me, that is, that's still considered money and it should be under the guidance of the Transmitter Act. Right. I didn't hear a question there, but if you want to comment, you're welcome uh, to. Just to speak clearly, the, the value of a distributed ledger is that no one person is the actual transmitter. That what's actually happening is all participants in the network, all of the nodes and all of the miners are helping to validate the trans that the actual transactions. So to basically treat any one participant as a money transmitter really kind of goes against the grain of what the network is about. It, it defies the actual definition of how the network works. All right, committee, any other questions? All right, uh, thank you, Senator. We have a few testifiers here. Um, Let's go with Mr. David Riley. I believe we've got him virtually. Let's see if we can have better luck this time. Hey, welcome, uh, Mr. Parent Parentis. Can you hear yes, us? Yes, thank you. Thank All you right, uh, Mr. Parentis, if you will, so for the record, thank you for joining us, but for the record, would you state your name and who you represent? And then you have two minutes. I certainly will, Mr. Chairman. My name is Simon Parentis, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, thank you to the committee for your careful consideration of this bill and uh, to Senator Herndon for his work in presenting it and for doing such a fine job of educating with respect to it. Uh, I live in North Idaho in Sandpoint. I've lived here for seven years and my interest in Bitcoin extends from a personal perspective. I don't personally mine Bitcoin today, but I do own it and I do obviously uh, appreciate the freedom to not only own Bitcoin in the state of Idaho, but to have the freedom to save in it uh, I have five children and we're all we're, uh, teaching them the, the basics of money and what money is and what, what it isn't and how to save and store value for the future. And, and the beautiful part about Bitcoin is, is it gives me a way to freely exchange the value of my time and my work and the energy that I put into the natural resources and skills that I have and be able to store that and then transfer that to other individuals for the, the work that they have done and the value that they have done. I also work for a company called Unchained. We're a Bitcoin financial services company, and it allows me to speak to the concept of how Bitcoin mining is done uh, across the country and the world, and also to the question of money transmitter licenses and what those are intended for. My, my company is a company that is underneath the guidance of a money transmitter license uh, in Idaho and other states across the country. And I think the restriction of that to companies that actually do hold funds for customers and then transmit them to other uh, customers or businesses, that money transfer license is absolutely a good concept and one that should apply to certain types of businesses. But I do believe that Senator Herndon is correct in differentiating a Bitcoin miner from 
that transact that money transmitter license because a Bitcoin miner is it's not serving as a, a holder of any of the funds that are being transacted in the mining business. They are simply operating the tool that is allowing that transfer to occur from one peer directly to the other peer. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate the opportunity to present and I'm uh, advocating for the bill. All right, thank you. Uh, senators, any, any questions? All right, um, th thank you, uh, Mr. Perantis. We appreciate your time today and, and taking out and coming, educating us and testifying on behalf of this. Thank you so much. All right, next up we've got, uh, let's go with Nick Nicholas. Looks like he's, he's here, Nicholas. Great. Mr. Kleinworth, if you would come forward and state your name, who you represent, and you have two minutes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Nicholas Kleinworth, and I am supporting this legislation on behalf of the Idaho Freedom Foundation. Um, in just five years' time, the value of the U.S. dollar has fallen by 16%. This means that Idahoans can afford less of their grocery budget, their travel, education, or even their home. Even when faced with this reality, the money printers in Washington, D.C. haven't stopped. During a time when Washington, D.C. has proven to be a poor steward of our financial system, Bitcoin promises to be a hard, portable, and finite solution for families to preserve their savings and provide for their needs. The legislation protects Idahoans' access to sound money. It recognizes the right for Idahoans to mine Bitcoin and protects mining businesses from undue regulations and discrimination. It protects the right to self-custody and use Bitcoin, and it ends the arduous task of trying to calculate taxes on Bitcoin when used as a method of payment for small purchases. Finally, it, it defends the right for Bitcoiners to secure the network and bolster its decentralized nature. But this bill is more than just about Bitcoin. Western political thought holds the right to private property tantamount to those of life and liberty. We are entering an era where, we, where real property does not need to be tangible. Though digital, Bitcoin is real property and warrants the same protections in this great state. So this bill is about defending the private property rights of our, our founders cherished and our government was constituted to defend. So mind you that this bill offers no carve outs or special favors for Bitcoiners. Rather, it simply protects the right for Idahoans to continue to use and preserve their own private assets. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll stand for any questions. All right, thank you. Senators, any questions? All right, I guess you did great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Um, let's see. Let's see if we can get Dennis Porter virtually. Okay, welcome, uh, Mr. Porter. Uh, welcome to the. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, if you would, for the record, state your name and who you represent, and you have two minutes to testify to us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. My name is Dennis Porter. I am the CEO and co-founder for a national advocacy group which focuses on ad educating lawmakers and regulators on the benefits of Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. I am regularly asked to testify and provide briefings on this matter to state and federal officials. I'm here to voice my support for Senate Bill 1296, sponsored by Senator Herndon, and to answer questions for this committee with regards to Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. At its core, Bitcoin represents freedom. It's a decentralized currency that empowers individuals offering an alternative to traditional financial systems where control is often in the hands of a few. In Idaho, independence and self-reliance are cherished. Bitcoin aligns perfectly with these values. Bitcoin provides Idahoans with the freedom to transact on their own terms, enhances financial inclusivity, and opens the doors to a global market without the need for a middleman. But Bitcoin is more than just a currency. It's a catalyst for innovation, especially in the realm of Bitcoin mining which represents a unique opportunity for Idaho to become a leader on the technology of the future. Bitcoin mining, the process through which new Bitcoins are created and transactions are processed, requires significant computational power and consequentially energy. This demand can be a boon for Idaho, driving the development and utilization of a nascent data center infrastructure, which often drives jobs, 
particularly in rural parts of the country. Idaho is blessed with abundant natural resources, including geothermal, solar, and hydroelectric power. By harnessing these energy sources for Bitcoin mining, Idaho can become a leader in developing this industry. This in turn can attract investments, create jobs, and foster a new ecosystem of technology and energy innovation. Moreover, Bitcoin mining can serve as a stabilizing force for Idaho's power grid. Through demand response programs, mining operations can be dialed back during peak demand times, providing flexibility and reliability to Idaho's energy infrastructure. This, is not only this not only ensures a more stable grid, but has the potential to save the grid during extreme weather or natural disasters. As an example, during Winter Storm Elliott in December of 2022, Bitcoin miners wound down and made enough power available to heat 1.5 million small homes. In conclusion, embracing Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining offers Idaho a path to strengthen its economy, its energy independence, and its commitment to innovation. By positioning Idaho at the forefront of this technology and financial evolution, we can, se can secure a prosperous future for all Idahoans. Thank you for considering this opportunity. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak, and I uh, I'm available for questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Uh, Senator Ricks. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, Mr. Porter, and I, <clears throat> I have to admit, I'm not an expert at all on on Bitcoin and this type of technology. I've heard about it for a long time, and I do have a you know pretty extensive computer background. Okay, computer guys are always a little leery of other computer guys in some respects, but. Uh, tell me, if you've got, uh, how, how does the average person benefit from this? So let's say you've got John Doe, he works at the local uh, grocery store, he makes $100,000 a year. Um, how does this replace or uh, our current uh, dollar that we have? I mean, how would he buy things? How would he get paid in this? How would he do transactions if he had a little money saved? Would he convert that to Bitcoin? T tell me how this would, I guess, infiltrate in and, and we use it instead of dollars a little bit more. Mr. Porter. Thank you for the question, uh, Kim. Um, yes, yeah, certainly there are many Idahoans who currently today use Bitcoin predominantly as a savings technology. Although over the next you know, 5, 10, maybe 20 years, it may be used more further as a medium exchange, similar to the dollar. But in the time being, I think most Idahoans will use it as a savings technology in absence of traditional currencies being stable enough to support that sort of approach. Today, most people do not use the dollar or any fiat or paper um, or government backed currencies for saving. It's very rare for people to see that as a dominant form of savings. Typically, people will save in other types of assets and Bitcoin is a, is a sophisticated asset for them to be able to, to save in. Outside of, outside of the, uh, them being able to use it as a savings technology, uh, Bitcoin mining will also provide powerful uh, grid stabilization results to the state of Idaho, which could also provide downward pressure on rates for those that live in the state, as well as a more stable grid. All right, follow up. Yeah, so follow up. So on that, so if a person had a uh, an, an IRA and they had money and a hundred thousand dollars in it, you say this is a more stable uh, method than the dollar. How would a person use? convert their value of $100,000 into Bitcoin. There's a number of different ways that, um, oh, sorry for interrupting. There's a number of different ways for um, allocating to Bitcoin. You could buy it directly from an exchange the same way that you would buy a stock. You can buy one of the new recently released uh, Bitcoin ETFs from the 11 different issuers that have issued them. Or you can buy it uh, from someone in person. Let's say you are I have a friend and he has some Bitcoin that he wants to sell to you. You could buy that Bitcoin from that person in a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. Follow up. Okay, yeah, and then thank you. Um, so the value and when you receive a Bitcoin, uh, and I assume this is still subject to uh, devaluation as well, because I've seen some of the earlier uh, uh, different types of a system some of them ran up in value and then they crash way back down too i mean there are a lot of these coins uh, these styles pretty stable now or is there just kind of a handful that are going to make it uh, make it uh, long term mr porter there's certainly a debate around the various different cryptocurrencies and the way that they compete um, for the purposes of this bill it is almost entirely focused on bitcoin um, bitcoin is the most stable and has um, been the one that most people have put their trust in. So I wouldn't say that um, there's even very many cryptocurrencies that even compare to Bitcoin. 
but there maybe is a few that are slightly more they're on the timetable of how stable uh, bitcoin has been but predominantly i would say most people should focus on bitcoin if they're planning on using it as a stable form of long-term savings technology all right thank you okay thanks mr porter any other questions all right seeing none uh, mr porter in your you talked about uh that Bitcoin mining has a tendency to stabilize the uh, grid system. And you used an example where uh, some of them actually took, turned off their data mining in order to conserve some electricity. But this bill seems to do just the opposite. It says that it's saying the power company, you cannot plan on something different. You can't have a special rate classification. Um, and yet we've we, you've said and also uh, Senator Hearn talked about the uh, the amount of power that's used and so I guess I would ask the question how does it really stabilize I mean and it's all volunteer if I want to turn off my data mining great is, is there something I'm missing Mr. Porter it's a great question um, chairman there's a couple of different reasons why someone might curtail their energy consumption with when mining Bitcoin. One may be because the price of power has exceeded the break-even cost for mining Bitcoin. Mining Bitcoin is an, not only energy intensive, it is an expensive process. And so if energy prices are peaking, which is generally during the moment that demand is high, a Bitcoin miner will wind off in order to avoid having to pay more than what they would get if they mined the Bitcoin. So essentially it's cost avoidance. Um, the other one is because they are part of a demand response or what are called ancillary service program. Ancillary service programs are programs that Grid operators and utilities offer all across the country. As a very good example in Texas, which has one of the most advanced grids as, when, as it pertains to providing these services, Bitcoin miners have gone there and have really started to participate in the grid at scale. And so that example that I provided earlier was one where Bitcoin miners wound down during Winter Storm Elliott, delivering one, you know, 1,500 megawatts of power back to the grid, which is enough power to heat 1.5 million ho um, homes, or it's enough power to energize 300 large hospitals. But they do that because they're part of a program where they sign up and say, hey, I, Mr. Grid Operator, I am willing to shut my operation down when you need me to in exchange for uh, certain types of incentives. And those incentives are available to all players, all users of energy. Um, it just so happens that Bitcoin miners are better at it than most people are. All right. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Appreciate it. Um, not seeing any other questions. I appreciate you being here and, and sharing your testimony on this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. We are running out of time. We've got one more witness testimony. If we can do it really quick, uh, Megan Ronk. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Hi. members of the committee. My name is Megan Ronk, and I serve as the Director of Economic Development and Innovation for Idaho Power. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background on my role, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is I work with large users on our system, so commercial and industrial users across all industries um, and help them get interconnected, whether they're existing customers that are looking to expand or new customers that are looking at our service area. And so I think that kind of puts me in a really unique position because on a very regular basis, my team has the opportunity to work with these cryptocurrency mining companies as they're um, exploring new operations. And I, one thing I just wanted to state kind of first and foremost is that we do not have concerns about these types of projects connecting to our system. I think our concern just comes to, down to the point that we want to be able to treat them in the same fair and equi equitable way that we do uh, all other customers that we serve. It's been brought up earlier today um, that some of the provisions in this legislation, including um, Section 28-5404, that really carves out um, the, the non-discriminatory practices. You know, our perspective is that this creates confusion. It's duplicative. Um, there has already been very clear Idaho statute um, 61-315. It's been in code since 1913 with the establishment of the Idaho Public Utilities Commission 
that very clearly states that utilities do not have the ability to discriminate against different types of customers. And so we believe that this provision, again, is already an Idaho statute and there's no need for a specific carve out for not only just a particular industry, if you wanna call kind of the broad cryptocurrency space as an industry, but I think one of our other concerns is this entire legislation is, is structured around one type of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. And there are over 23,000 types of cryptocurrency that exist out there. And in my experience in working with some of these prospective customers, you know, these miners are switching between mining Bitcoin, mining a different type of cryptocurrency, depending on what's happening with those market conditions. And so I think it creates, again, a lot of confusion that we would kind of carve out specific Bitcoin. One of the issues that I'd also like to raise that was mentioned just a few minutes ago is um, about the grid balancing statements um, related to this type of activity. If anything, I would suggest cryptocurrency mining activities um, create additional demand on our system that we certainly have to work with them and look for opportunities to mitigate. And finally, um, I would just like to point out a concern with the definition of Bitcoin mining business. Um, it talks about the uh, annual use of a megawatt. And a megawatt is more of a reference to sort of the peak demand. Um, if you think back to your bills that you receive from your local utility, we, we look at annual use based on kilowatt hours or megawatt hours. That one megawatt definition really refers to more of like a moment in time of peak demand and doesn't reflect a customer's annual um, energy consumption over the course of, of a year. So it's for those reasons that um, from an Idaho Power perspective, we believe that this legislation, uh, Senate Bill 1296, creates a number of critical flaws, creates confusion and duplication, um, and we would urge you to oppose this legislation. So Mr. Chairman, with that, I'd be happy to stand for questions. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone have any quick questions? All right, Senator Lakey. Ms. Ronk, so you, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You bring up some things that I think are really just maybe use of the term. Um, is, maybe there's a better word to describe the annual usage instead of megawatt. Um, Bitcoin is really defined more broadly than just Bitcoin in one. It's kind of like, give me a Kleenex instead of a facial tissue. Mm -hmm. um, so it's broader. And then the, the language in the discrimination portion, I haven't had a chance to look at 61315, um, but sometimes we do belt and suspenders. And if the same language is there, we can have that discussion or utilize the same language. But is there an opportunity to, to make a couple of those technical tweaks um, in working with Senator Herndon on those, that particular terminology? And Ms. have Ronk. you offered him alternative language? Ms. Strong. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Lakey, I haven't been involved in specific um, conversations with Senator Herndon. I'm sure we'd always be happy to discuss and find if there's opportunities to um, align on language. I know that our team um, has had and, and been engaged in some conversations. You know, again, I just, I appreciate the, the comment that at times we can make sure that we're just reiterating uh, language that's already in Idaho code. Um, from my perspective, I just can't think of any other situation where we're particularly carving out an industry or a type of, of operation from this um, non-discriminatory non-discriminatory rate making statute. So I, I think our view is just it's, it's unnecessary and duplicative. Right. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank um, you. Senators, we are out of time. If there is not an object, ob objection to this, I would like to have some more discussion on this and hold this over to Thursday. Is anyone object to that? Senator Foreman? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't object, but uh, I did have a motion if you'd entertain that, which might dovetail into exactly what you're you're thinking. Um, go for it. <laughs> Thank you. I move that uh, we send Senate Bill 1296 to the 14th order for possible amendments so that some 
agreements can be worked out between the stakeholders. Is, is there a second? Not hearing a second. Uh, again, I would like to come back and, and uh, discuss this. So if we can, I, I'm going to call meeting at, at ease or, or we're done for the day and leave and let the other group come in here. So we're done.